Chapter 1 The Wager In 1872, in the city of London, many prominent gentlemen gathered at the Reform Club. One of these gentlemen was Phileas Fogg. Fogg was a handsome man with a silver beard. Although he was well known around the club, people knew very little about Fogg's private life. His only daily activities were reading newspapers and playing a card game called Whist. Phileas Fogg lived alone in a mansion. He employed a single butler. The only requirement of Fogg's butler was perfect promptness and regularity in his work. In fact, on October 2nd, Fogg fired his current butler because he had brought him his shaving water at 84 degrees Fahrenheit rather than 86. On this late morning, Fogg was waiting for a new butler to arrive between 11 and half past. Mr. Fogg sat perfectly still in his chair as there was a knock at the door. A man entered and introduced himself as Jean Passepartout. He was a Frenchman from Paris. He had been a singer, a horse rider, and a tightrope walker in a circus. Five years ago, he had come to England to seek a quiet life as a butler. Mr. Passepartout, said Phileas Fogg, do you know that I require my butler to always be on time? Yes, monsieur, Passepartout replied. Very well, then. From this moment, you are my new butler. Then Phileas Fogg left without a word. Passepartout inspected the house. It was perfectly clean and orderly. He found a card describing his daily duties. The list explained everything he must do from the time Mr. Fogg woke up at 8 until he went to bed at midnight. Meanwhile, Fogg went to the Reform Club. After having his meals and reading several newspapers, Phileas Fogg met his usual whist partners. As they began playing, Thomas Flanagan asked, Have you heard about the robbery? Yes, replied Stuart. The bank is going to lose that money. I disagree, replied Ralph. Skilled detectives have been sent all around the world to catch the robber. No country is safe for him. That's silly, said Stuart. A man can now go around it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago. So you think the thief will get away just because he can circle the world in three months? Chided Flanagan. In 80 days, said Fogg. That's true, agreed John Sullivan. It only takes 80 days now that Rothel and Allahabad in India are connected by railway. Sullivan continued. The newspaper stated it like this. London to Suez by train and steamboat, seven days. Suez to Bombay by steamboat, 13 days. Bombay to Calcutta by train, three days. Calcutta to Hong Kong by steamboat, 13 days. Hong Kong to Yokohama by steamboat, six days. Yokohama to San Francisco by steamboat, 22 days. San Francisco to New York by train, seven days. New York to London by steamboat and train, nine days. Total, 80 days. Yes, 80 days, but that doesn't take into account bad weather, shipwrecks, and train accidents, said Stuart. It's all included, returned Phileas Fogg, playing his hand at whist. It's absurd. I'd be willing to wager 4,000 pounds on it, cried Stuart. I have 20,000 in a savings account that I will wager, Fogg said calmly. Are, Are you, you joking? joking? Asked members of the group. An Englishman does not joke about such wagers, Fogg replied very seriously. I will bet the 20,000 against anyone who wishes. Do you accept? We, we accept. accept, replied the group of men. We will each contribute 4,000 pounds to match your 20,000. Good, said Phileas Fogg. The train leaves for Dover at a quarter before nine. I will take it this evening. Then Fogg wrote them a check for the money. He had only wagered half of his 40,000 pound fortune because he knew that he would need the other half to complete the trip around the world. 
Back at home, Passepartout was studying his list of responsibilities. He was surprised when Fogg walked in at an unscheduled time. Fogg went to his bedroom and called for his butler. Passepartout, I want you to put two shirts and three pairs of socks in a small bag for me. Do the same for yourself. We'll buy new clothes as we go. We're going to catch a train in ten minutes. Where are we going, Monsieur? Asked Passepartout. We are going around the world in eighty days. We don't have a minute to lose," replied Fogg. Passepartout didn't know what to say. He did as his master instructed. By eight o'clock, the bags were packed. Phileas Fogg had a copy of Bradshaw's Continental Railway and Steamboat Guide under his arm. He opened one of the bags and put in a large roll of money that was enough to take them anywhere. "Take care of this bag," said Fogg. "There are twenty thousand pounds in there." Passepartout almost dropped the bag when he heard how much money he was carrying. Then they took a taxi to the train station. Chapter Two, Detective Fix. A few days later, London's chief of police was sitting in his office at nine o'clock in the evening. Suddenly, the chief was handed a telegram that read, "Suez, Egypt to London, Rowan, Chief of Police, Scotland Yard. I've found the bank robber, Phileas Fogg. Quickly send an arrest warrant to Bombay." The telegram was sent by a British detective named Fix. Mr. Fix had been sent to Suez to hunt for the thief. He was a small, nervous man, with bright eyes and eyebrows that were always twitching up and down. Fix had been waiting at the docks of Suez for several days. He expected the criminal to look like an honest man. In his opinion, the greatest robbers always looked like honest folks. When the Mongolia came into the port. Fix looked carefully at the face of each person getting off the ship. Suddenly, a man came up to him and asked if he knew where he could get a passport stamped. Fix looked at the passport and asked, "Is it yours?" "No, it's my master's," said the man. The picture of Phileas Fogg matched the description of the thief exactly. "Where is your master now?" asked Fix. "He's on board the Mongolia." Fix thought quickly. He knew he would have to get Fogg off the ship and keep him in Suez to catch him. Your master will have to bring this passport to the consulate to be stamped in person. I'll go and get him," said Passepartout. Fix quickly went to the English consul's office and said, "I believe the thief is a passenger on the Mongolia. I need to keep him here until I can get the arrest warrant from London. Can you detain him?" No, I have no right to detain him until an arrest warrant is issued," said the counsel. At that moment, Fogg and Passepartout entered the office. Fix remained unnoticed at the back of the room. Accepting Fogg's passport, the counsel told him, "You know a stamp is unnecessary. No passport is required for British citizens traveling in Egypt or India." "I know," replied Fogg. But I wish to have proof of my travels. Very well," said the counsel, and he stamped Fogg's passport. Back on the Mongolia, Fogg updated his journal. On that day, Friday, October ninth, he noted his arrival in Suez and that he had neither gained nor lost any time. Passepartout was enjoying the scenery on the dock. Well, my friend. Said Mr. Fix, walking up to him. Were you able to get your passport stamped all right? Yes, the passport is fine," replied Passepartout. "But we're traveling so fast that I feel like I'm journeying through a dream." "Why are you in such a hurry?" asked Mr. Fix. "I'm not in a hurry," said Passepartout. "But my master is." "But where is your master going?" asked Fix. "Always straight ahead." He is going around the world in eighty days," exclaimed Passepartout. "He says it's on a wager, but I think something else is going on." "Yes, your master sounds like quite a character. Is he rich?" 
He's carrying a large amount of cash with him, and he's not afraid to spend it. All of this information only convinced Fix that Fogg was the thief. Fix returned to the council's office and asked the council to send a telegraph to the chief of police. I'm going to follow this rogue to India, which is English ground. Once that warrant arrives in Bombay, I'll be able to arrest him politely with the warrant in my hand, thought the detective. During the voyage, Phileas stayed in the saloon playing whist. Meanwhile, Passepartout was enjoying a meal in the forward cabin when Mr. Fix approached him again. While meeting, Fix and Passepartout became friends. By the time the Mongolia reached Aden, they were 15 hours ahead of schedule. And by the time they reached Bombay on October 20th, they'd gained two days. Phileas Fogg calmly entered this information in his journal. Chapter 3 Across India It was 4.30 when the Mongolia landed and its passengers went ashore. Fogg ordered Passbar 2 to be at the train station by 8 p.m. to catch the train to Calcutta. Then he went to the British consulate to get his passport stamped. Mr. Fix quickly went to the Bombay police headquarters. There he asked if his arrest warrant had arrived yet, but it hadn't arrived yet. Fix realized that he would just have to keep following Fogg and Passepartout until the warrant arrived. Passepartout decided to look around Bombay. He followed a parade that was marching through the streets. Soon after, the Frenchman entered a beautiful pagoda at the top of Malabar Hill. He didn't know Christians couldn't enter Indian temples, or that even Indians must remove their shoes before going inside. Suddenly, Passepartout was knocked to the floor. He found himself being beaten by three angry priests. They shouted and tore off his shoes, but Passepartout quickly jumped up and ran out of the pagoda as fast as he could. When Passepartout arrived at the train station, he was shoeless, hatless, and without the package of clothes Fogg had sent him to purchase. From a hidden corner, Mr. Fix listened to Passepartout tell Phileas Fogg what had happened at the pagoda. Now Fogg's servant had committed an offense on Indian land. He would be able to arrest them in Calcutta and hold them until the warrant arrived. At 8 a.m. on 22nd October, the train stopped 15 miles past Rothole. They were in the middle of a very small village. Passengers will get out here, announced the conductor. Passepartout rushed out to find out the reason and came back crying. Monsieur Fogg, the railway has ended. They soon learned that the railway wasn't finished. There was a gap of 50 miles between where the train had stopped and Allahabad, where the line picked up again. By this time, the other passengers were beginning to leave for Allahabad by wagon, horse and mule. Fogg also searched the village for transport, but found nothing. Passepartout had more luck, announcing, I think I found a way to get to Allahabad. There's an elephant that belongs to an Indian near here. The elephant's name was Keone. Mr. Fogg decided he would rent it. Fogg made several generous offers, but the owner refused them all. Then he offered to buy the animal for 2,000 pounds, it was too much money for the man to refuse. Fogg then hired a local Parsi man to guide them and the elephant to Allahabad. This part of India was not under British control. They occasionally came across bands of ferocious Indians who shook their fists and shouted angrily. That night, they stayed in an old cabin on the edge of the jungle. At six the next morning, they resumed their journey. At 4 p.m., the elephant stopped moving. A noise from the jungle was getting closer. They could hear a chorus of human voices accompanied by brass instruments. Then the guide announced, It's a procession of the Brahmins coming our way. We must not let them see us. They hid behind some trees and were very quiet. 
the voices came nearer. Fogg could see priests in long robes surrounded by men, women and children who were singing a terrible and sad chant. Behind them was a cart carrying a statue of a woman with four arms and her tongue sticking out. Kelly, the goddess of love and death, whispered the guide. A group of holy men led a beautiful young woman who looked European. She staggered along behind them. She was covered in rich robes, golden jewelry and gems. Then came another cart, on which was the dead body of a very old man. He was dressed like a king, or as they say in India, a Raja. This is a sati, a human sacrifice. She will be burned tomorrow with her dead husband, who was the Raja of Bundarkund, said the guide. But why doesn't she try to escape? asked Fogg. She's been drugged. They will take her to the pagoda of Pelagi and sacrifice her at dawn. We will save her, said Fogg. Save the woman? cried Passepartout. But the wager, the steamboat in Calcutta. I have twelve hours to spare. We will be on the steamboat to Hong Kong. Sir, you are a man of heart, admired Passepartout. They waited in the jungle until nighttime. The guide told them about the woman. Her name was Auda. She was an orphan who had received a European education. When she had grown up, the elderly Raja noticed her beauty. She was forced to marry him against her will. When dawn came, the Brahmins gathered around the pyre. Fogg and the guide walked up behind the group. Auda was placed on the top of the pyre with the old Raja's corpse. The Brahmins lit the wood at the bottom of the pyre and it began to smoke. Then suddenly the dead Raja stood up. The Brahmins threw themselves upon the ground. They were afraid to even look at their resurrected master. Then the Raja picked up the woman and ran down the smoking pyre through the crowd to fog. It wasn't the Raja but rather pass part two in the Raja's clothes. They traveled quickly and escaped. As they traveled toward Allahabad, the woman, Auda, was dazed from all the drugs. They reached the train station at Allahabad by 10 o'clock. Once on the train to Calcutta, Auda became conscious. With tears, she thanked the men for rescuing her. She claimed to have a wealthy uncle in Hong Kong. Fogg decided to take her there. The train reached Calcutta at 7 a.m. There were five hours until the steamboat, Rangoon, left for Hong Kong at noon. The two days gained between London and Bombay had been lost, but Phileas Fogg had no regrets. As Fogg leapt from the train, he was greeted by several policemen. Mr. Phileas Fogg, is this your servant? asked the policeman, pointing to Passepartout. He is. Both of you please follow us. The policemen took them before the judge. The judge told Fogg and Passepartout that they were being charged with the desecration of a native shrine. He also showed them Passepartout's shoes as proof. Fix had used Passepartout's misunderstanding at the pagoda in Bombay as a way to keep Fogg in Calcutta. Since he was Fogg's butler, Fogg was guilty too. The judge sentenced Passepartout to 15 days in prison and Fogg to a week in prison. Fix rubbed his hands with satisfaction, but Fogg was not worried. I offer bail, he said to the judge. You have that right, said the judge. I will pay it at once, said Fogg, pulling the cash from his bankroll. This money will be returned to you upon your release from prison said the judge. At least give me back my shoes, cried Passepartout angrily. Mr. Fix followed them and observed them boarding the steamboat Rangoon. Chapter 4. Clowning Around The trip from Calcutta to Hong Kong would take them 10 to 12 days. Auda soon became familiar with her protectors and expressed her gratitude for being rescued over and over again. 
The weather on the final days of the voyage became very bad. The boat moved so slowly that it would reach Hong Kong 20 hours behind schedule. But Phileas Fogg never worried. On the morning of the 6th, land was sighted. Fogg was more than 24 hours behind. The steamboat for Yokohama would be missed. But the captain had some good news for them. The Carnatic had a broken boiler and could not leave yesterday, said he. She'll sail for Yokohama tomorrow at high tide. By 1 p.m., the passengers of the Rangoon went ashore. Fogg went to search for Auda's uncle, who was a wealthy merchant. He learned that her uncle had made a huge fortune and retired to Holland two years ago. Auda was disappointed when she heard the news. What shall I do now? She asked. You'll come around the world and back to Europe with us. Then I can take you to Holland, replied Fogg. Fogg sent Passport 2 to the Carnatic to buy three tickets to Yokohama. Inside the ship's office, he learned that the repairs to the Carnatic had been completed ahead of schedule. The ship would be leaving that evening instead of the following morning. That's good news for my master, said Passport 2. Passport 2 met Mr. Fix in front of the Carnatic. Fix invited him to a tavern for a drink. They ordered two bottles of red wine. When they were drinking, Fix said, Well, I'm going to tell you everything. I am a police detective. I'm following Fogg. He is the bank robber. You must help me. This is nonsense, shouted Passport 2. I could never betray my master. Well, said Mr. Fix, then act like I've told you nothing. Let's finish the drink. Fix put a drug in Passepartout's drink without being noticed. Angrily, Passepartout took his drink and instantly went to sleep. As Passepartout did not come back by the next morning, Fogg decided that they would have to leave without him. He and Auda traveled to the dock. There they met Mr. Fix and learned that the Carnatic had sailed the night before. Fogg began to wander around the docks, searching for a vessel he could hire. Fogg met Captain Bunsby, who had a small fast ship named the Tankadur. Bunsby told them that Yokohama was too far. They couldn't get there by the time the boat for San Francisco departed. But there is another way, said Bunsby. The steamboat for Yokohama to San Francisco starts in Shanghai at 7 p.m. on the 11th. We could make the 800 miles to Shanghai in time to catch that boat. Fogg made a deal with Bunsby and then told Mr. Fix that he could accompany them at no expense. As the sails of the ship were hoisted, Fogg looked for Passepartout once again. But Passepartout did not show up as the tankadier left for Shanghai. By 7 p.m. on the evening of the 11th, they were only three miles outside of Shanghai Harbor. As they neared the port, they saw black smoke rising up from a steamer. It was the American steamer leaving Shanghai for its 22-day voyage to San Francisco. Signal her, Phileas Fogg said quietly. The captain raised a signal flag and fired a little cannon. Meanwhile, Passepartout rushed to the Carnatic, which was just about to leave after he awoke. He searched the ship for Phileas Fogg and Auda, but failed to find them. He knew he would have nothing once he reached Japan. At dawn on the 13th of November, the Carnatic entered the port of Yokohama. Passepartout went ashore, feeling worried about how he would survive. Passepartout knew he needed to find a way to make money and get out of Japan. After walking around for two days, he saw a clown holding a sign written in English. The sign read, Great Attraction, The Long Noses, Acrobatic Japanese Troupe, The Honorable William Batukar, Proprietor, Last Presentations, Prior to Their Departure for the United States. The United States? Thought Passepartout. That's where I want to go. He followed the clown. At a large arena, 
he met William Batukar. After a short interview, Batukar decided to use him as a clown. Passepartout's first performance with the long noses was at 3 p.m. The arena was quickly filled with people from Europe, China, and Japan. During the performance, the long noses formed a human pyramid that reached all the way to the ceiling. As the pyramid reached the ceiling, Passepartout saw two familiar faces in the audience. There were Phileas Fogg and Auda. Master! Master! Passepartout cried. He crawled out from under the base of the pyramid. The human pyramid collapsed. Long-nosed clowns fell everywhere. Passepartout, is that you? asked Fogg. It is me, monsieur. Very well, then. Let's go to the steamer. Mr. Batukar was furious. He demanded payment for the breakage of his human pyramid. Fogg handed him some money. Then they boarded the American steamboat, the General Grant. Passepartout was still wearing wings and a long nose. Passepartout told his master what had happened in Shanghai, but he didn't mention that Mr. Fix had tricked him. He felt that the time was not right for that revelation. Auda soon found her feelings toward Fong deepening. Passepartout also made the happy discovery. Mr. Fix was still in pursuit of Phileas Fogg. He remained concealed to avoid Passepartout's anger. But Passepartout and Fix met on the deck. When Passepartout saw Fix, he grabbed him by the throat and punched him in the face. Fix brushed himself off and said, I still think he's the bank robber, but I want him back in England, where his crime can be proven in a court of law. Eleven days later, the General Grant entered San Francisco Bay. Phileas Fogg had neither gained nor lost a single day. Chapter 5, Across America Phileas Fogg and the others arrived in America at 7 a.m. Before they got on the train, Passepartout asked if they should buy some guns. He felt they might need protection while crossing America. The American railway traveled between the east and west coasts. The train track that stretched between Omaha and San Francisco included dangers such as wild beasts, wearing Native Americans, and angry Mormons. The train left Oakland at 6 p.m. Passepartout found himself seated next to Mr. Fix, but he refused to speak to the detective. After breakfast the next morning, Fogg and his companions watched herds of buffaloes crossing the valley like brown waves. Thousands of the huge beasts passed back and forth over the train track. The train waited for three hours until the creatures left. Three days later, as the train passed through the Wyoming Territory, they suddenly heard savage cries. The train was under attack by wild Sioux natives. A hundred of them with guns had jumped on the moving train and attacked the passengers. The passengers carried pistols and shot at the Indians. In the front of the train in the engine room, the engineer and the coal stoker were dead from Sioux rifles. The Sioux chief wanted to stop the train, but couldn't control it. He opened the steam valve and sent the train speeding forward as fast as it could go. At the same time, Sioux warriors attacked every car, jumping from roof to roof. Fogg and the conductor found themselves fighting next to each other. When the conductor was shot and fell down, he said, Unless this train is stopped in five minutes, we're going to crash and die. Passepartout heard this and slipped through a door. He crawled along under the car, holding on to the chains. He detached the engine from the train cars. The cars were left behind while the engine sped forward. The train cars continued to roll for a few minutes and then stopped. They were a hundred feet from Kearney Station. When the Sioux fighters saw the soldiers coming up, they left immediately. The passengers were counted. None were dead, but three were missing, including Passepartout. Many of the passengers were badly wounded. Quietly, Fogg said, Living or dead, I'll find him. The captain of the soldiers said, Sir, you shall not go alone. 
You can take 30 of my men. Auda waited nervously. At 7 a.m. the next morning, even the captain was worried. He considered whether he should send another group to rescue the first. Then they heard gunshots. A mile in the distance, they could see Mr. Fogg marching with the group of soldiers, as well as Passbar 2 and the other two passengers. The soldiers welcomed them back with joyful cries. The train! Where is the train? cried Passbar 2. It's gone, replied Fix. Phileas Fogg was running 20 hours behind. They were stuck in Fort Kearney, 200 miles from Omaha and the train to New York. Then Mr. Fix proposed a solution. A gentleman I met last night has offered to take us to Omaha on a sled with sails. Fogg and his companions went to a man named Mudge. Fogg looked at a large metal sled on two skis that had two sails. There was enough room for five or six passengers to sit. By 8 a.m., the sled was ready, and the passengers sat down. The two great sails were hoisted, and the sled caught the wind. It began to slide over the hardened snow at 40 miles per hour. Luckily, the wind stayed strong. By noon, they crossed the Platte River, and less than an hour later, they stood at the train station in Omaha, Nebraska. Fogg rewarded Mudge and shook his hand. Within minutes, they were on a train bound for New York. They arrived in New York by 11.15 p.m. on the 11th. But the steamer, the China, had left for Liverpool just 45 minutes before they had arrived. Chapter 6, On the Way Home The next morning, Fogg went down to the docks to find a ship to hire privately. He saw a mid-sized ship that was puffing steam, a sign that it was ready to leave. Fogg boarded the Henrietta and met the captain, a tough-looking man named Andrew Speedy. Speedy was not going to Liverpool, but rather Bordeaux, France. So Fogg paid the captain 2,000 pounds for each passenger to travel with him to Liverpool. By noon the next day, Captain Speedy was no longer in control of the ship anymore. He was locked in his cabin like a prisoner. Speedy tried to cheat them and go to Bordeaux, his original destination. For the next few days, Fogg piloted the ship through rough weather. The ship's engineer came to speak with Mr. Fogg. Passepartout listened to their conversation. He was terrified to hear that the ship had burned up all of its coal and did not have enough to reach Liverpool. Phileas Fogg told Passepartout to let Captain Speedy out of his cabin. I want you to sell me your ship, Fogg said to the captain seriously. I'm going to burn her for fuel. Fogg pulled a roll of American dollars out of his pocket. Here's $60,000. Okay, Captain Speedy accepted the offer quietly. As soon as Fogg had bought the Henrietta, he ordered the sailors to strip every bit of wood from the cabin and the deck to burn for fuel. By the 20th, the Henrietta was now only a flat platform of iron. Fogg had only 24 hours to reach London. By docking at Queenstown, they could take a train to Dublin and then a fast boat to Liverpool, thereby gaining a few hours. Twenty minutes before noon on December 21st, Fogg and his companions went ashore at Liverpool Dock. They were only six hours away from London. Suddenly, Fogg felt a hand on his shoulder. It was Mr. Fix. Phileas Fogg, I arrest you in the Queen's name, said Mr. Fix. Phileas Fogg was put in prison. He sat in the cell with his eyes on his watch, silently hoping for a chance to get to London. In his journal, he wrote the words, December 21st, Saturday, Liverpool, 80th day, 11.40 a.m. Then he waited. Then, at 33 minutes past two, Fogg heard the door of his cell open. Mr. Fix entered. He was out of breath. Sir, he huffed, terribly sorry, a most unfortunate resemblance. The robber was arrested three days ago. You are free. Phileas Fogg was a free man. He looked Mr. Fix in the eyes. 
Then he knocked Mr. Fix down with a single punch. Well done, monsieur, cheered Passepartout. Fogg, Passepartout, and Auda took a cab to the train station. The express train to London had left 35 minutes prior, so Fogg ordered a special train to leave at 3. It was 10 minutes to 9 when they stepped off the train in London. Fogg was behind by 5 minutes. He had lost the wager. From the station, Fogg ordered Passepartout to go to the market for some food. Then he and Auda went home. Later that evening, Fogg had a private conversation with Auda. He began by saying, When I brought you here, I had a fortune, but now I am ruined. I pity you, continued Auda. But two lost souls may find comfort together. Will you take me for your wife? Suddenly, Phileas Fogg's lips began to tremble. He closed his eyes for an instant to think. When he reopened them, he said, Yes, by all that is holy, I love you. Ah. She cried and pressed his hand to her heart. Phileas Fogg called Passepartout immediately. When he entered the room, he saw Auda holding Fogg's hand and understood everything instantly. Fogg asked him to go and find Reverend Samuel Wilson at the local church. He wanted to know if it was not too late to schedule a wedding ceremony for the next day. It was five minutes to eight. For tomorrow, Monday? Asked Passepartout. Yes, for tomorrow, Monday, answered Phileas Fogg. Passepartout hurried off as fast as he could. At 35 minutes past eight, Passepartout staggered back to Fogg's house out of breath and said, Master, marriage tomorrow is impossible. But why so? asked Phileas Fogg. Because tomorrow is not Monday. Tomorrow is Sunday, and the Reverend has to perform his duties at church. There are only ten minutes left. Then Passepartout grabbed his master by the collar and threw him out the front door. Phileas Fogg jumped into a cab and calmly said, Take me to the Reform Club. Inside the Reform Club, Fogg's friends nervously began to round a whist. The clock ticked 18 minutes to nine. There was perfect silence in the room. One more minute, and they would be the winners. At the 57th second, the door opened. As the clock ticked on its 60th second, Phileas Fogg stepped in and said, Gentlemen, here I am. It was Phileas Fogg, in person, and on the correct day. Phileas Fogg won the wager. He had gained a day because the world moves westward, yet he had traveled eastward. The next day, when Fogg saw Passepartout, the butler said to him, I think we might have gotten around the world in 78 days if we hadn't crossed India. Then we would not have saved Auda, replied Fogg. Passepartout was shocked to see his master smiling, and I would not have gained a wife.